there is some sort of an uneasy calm in the polity. The reason is because Labour had given the federal government five days to make up their mind as to how much they'll be paid. And given what happened last week or last weekend on Friday, nobody knows what is going to happen because the federal government says, hmm, from 60,000, we can add 2,000 extra, 62,000. Labour is saying, we don't accept that. We need at least 250,000. So where do we go from here? What is Labour up to? What the governors have also, have also come out to say, even the 60,000 you're talking about, we can't afford to pay, is not sustainable. Some of us may have to borrow to pay salaries. So it's almost like a quagmire. We've been joined in the program to explore this conversation by Oju Demezwe, is an economist and the CEO of Flame Academy and Consulting Limited. He joins us via Zoom. Mr. Odemezwe, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. It's always my pleasure to join your program. And I'm sending greetings here from the city on the Thousand Hills, uh, Kigali in Rwanda. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So uh, how do you characterize what is playing out? Cold de sac, catch-22 situation, a quagmire. How do you characterize this? All of that and even more. It is very sad that we have to always quarrel, you know, after several years, you know, to be able to get uh, some uh, little increase in the so-called minimum wage. And when you look at the whole thing, the way it's playing out, you find that the problem remains bad and insincere leadership. Nigeria still needs to have leaders who can run Nigeria as a profitable enterprise, who must focus on the right things, you know, to incentivize and to reward, so that we get the kind of results that we need as a country. In business, in the business world, what you reward is what gets done. If you value the work that the public sector people, and indeed every other worker in Nigeria, whether in agriculture, or in a, in a hospital, or in a school, or in any other enterprise, if you value what they do, that you should focus on how to incentivize and reward their work. And that way, we get better productivity in public and even in informal and private uh, sector uh, businesses or agencies. But you know what? We don't you know, um, look at that. But what do we incentivize in Nigeria? We incentivize politics to you know, a very extreme level. A nation that is very broke and poor has not considered coming down a fiscal cliff. If you look at what Nigeria pays legislators in all the states, even those states that argue that they cannot afford 60,000, can we find out, can we even get uh, you know, some consultants or people to find out the amount of allowances that we pay these legislators? Somebody goes for an election and comes out lucky to be a legislator and over a, 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 a month or two, he becomes a millionaire or a billionaire. You know, somebody who, you know, didn't even go to secondary school, for example, because that's the minimum. I mean, the, a secondary school graduate who goes for, you know, a, a state uh, assembly comes up and you get all kinds of allowances, dressing allowance, wardrobe allowance, uh, car maintenance allowance, even you can monthly allowances that run into tens of millions for just politics. So because of that, what do you find? Nigeria has incentivized horrible politics. Today, people now kill. They do all manner of things to become a politician, whether at local government level or state level, to become a commissioner, to become a um, advisor to, uh, special advisor, advisor to special just find your way into the political corridor, and you are made. Meanwhile, the technocrats who are doing the job, who are ensuring that the uh, government affairs are being well run, that all the ministries and agencies of government are properly doing their work to direct the economy in the right way, are not rewarded for the work that they do. What do you now find? Extreme uh, low productivity, extreme hunger by these workers, side hustles by these workers, corruption everywhere. People are doing the work they are not committed to. Every public worker today must have to do something different to be able to sustain his own personal life and the life of his family. So we don't need all this struggle. If we have good leadership in Nigeria, we don't need this uh, a lot of continual NLC uh, problem to be able to you know, review our uh, wages to these workers. So it's wickedness, if you ask me, if you continue to have this argument. Because the government does not want to cut down our bad behavior. 
We don't want to adjust how much to spend. You hear that in a budget, somebody spent with one billion to build a BQ or a small quarter for a vice president of a company. You hear that to maintain uh, the uh, IT infrastructure for uh, a person in Asoro, you are spending 500 billion. Such frivolities and wicked spendings. So, and you see that in every state of this country, in, you know, and federal budget, what you can buy with one naira in Nigeria today is bought with one million naira in our budget. Whether it's uh, Enugu State or Sokoto State or whether it's uh, Ekiti State, everywhere in Nigeria, it's organized crime. We need a, a president of the mold of a business mogul, somebody who has run business enterprise, who can sit down with all stakeholders and say, guys, let's be realistic here. Nigeria, what, by the way, is about. Amazing. Uh, 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 you may have to, uh, you know, tamper your language a little bit uh, because there may be insufficient evidence to prove um, what you describe as organized crime. But you talked about the struggle, uh, which is uh, non-negotiable at this time amid the negotiations that would get uh, government and labor to a destination, which would be what would be agreeable. But to that, labor is saying that if... Um, the governors check corruption and be more prudent in spending. They can pay a minimum wage above 60,000 naira. But, uh, you know, the, the subnationals have also said that the realities of increased federal allocation that everybody is quoting also presents a challenge because the exchange rate has also seen an increase in every other uh, price of commodity uh, that they also subscribe to uh, in terms of, uh, you know, funding, infrastructure, and other aspects of development. So the question would be at this point that how can um, the governors, you know, um, be more accountable, draw up a, a balance sheet that would accommodate uh, a, a, a wage, a minimum wage higher above 60,000 naira in the light of increased federal allocation? Okay, so the, the point I'm making here is that we need to have governors and leaders who must sit down and look at the size of the workers in their states. How many people do we have after we remove all the ghost workers and all the padded uh, list of uh, uh, you know, employees? We are in this country together. And when I say things I say here, I say them with you know, conviction. I have had to engage legislators and people who even on their own tell me how horrible they feel approving some budgets and you do nothing about it. We see some of those things play out on television, but let me not go there. The point I'm making is that our leaders, our governors, our legislators have to be honest with us as a nation. Can we sit down and work out how many workers can we afford in the ministry? There's no point having five workers in a ministry or in a department you know, where none of them is committed to the work. Can we scale down and pay? If we're paying two or three people, we pay them well. So if governors can sit down and find out what's our wage bill in a month and what can we afford to be able to pay people decent salaries to get them committed to the work they do. That's why I say governors must work as business people. Can we afford what we're paying right now? And there are places we can cut down our expenses to be able to make up. That's how a businessman runs his business. Are we overspending in some areas? In some allowances, throwing parties, you know, in our travel expenses, a governor is traveling, and you have a retinue of eight going with him. You have a, 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 an assistant to the governor, you call in senior social assistant, then you have a junior assistant to the senior social assistant, you have a, other, other aides to the uh, assistant to the assistant, and all of those kind of packages. We have not addressed that yet. So I'm, I'm hopefully waiting for the Orontario uh, report to be, you know, um, also uh, uh, considered to scale down some uh, agencies that are multiplying or duplicating duties. If we do this, then we look at, okay, our state, how much do we earn from Abuja, the uh, federal uh, allocation, the fact allocation? And beyond that, what can we do in our state to bring about increased productivity, to explore the resources, human and material resources that we have in our state, to make money in, a, in a internal gener uh, generated uh, revenue and other ways to create uh, productivity in the state? Because of the structure of the country, governors don't feel accountable to raise revenue for running of their state. We are comfortable waiting for every month to go to Abuja and collect whatever the, uh, we are being given by the fact allocation uh, committee. So that's where the issue is. If you look at how much are we paying our 
political class, how much are we carrying in that um, portfolio? How many percent do we need to run our government in our state? Do we need all the aids right. and the legislative uh, for the uh, state legislators? How much allowances are we paying them? Is it fair compared to those who are doing the work in the ministries? That's the question I'm asking. So it's about corruption, it's about poor management skills, and it's about not being sincere with ourselves. This right. state that cried that we cannot pay 60,000, look at the Look at the government uh, security votes. Have they complained that, oh, security votes are too much? Uh, conspiracy project money to register uh, that is too much. Have we complained about those ones? We only bring up our, our complaints when it comes to saying how much we pay workers. Okay. That's the problem. So part of the debate, really, and I don't know how, how close we are to resolving all of these issues, because it looks like the more you try to resolve, the more the issues keep coming, and we wait to see what Labour will do. But part of the debate has been, if you have for the private sector, um, employers say, well, this is how much I can pay based on what is coming in, right? So can't governors also hide behind that argument and say, well, based on the allocation we're getting, which is not the same, by the way, uh, what uh, state A is getting is not what state B is getting. Some states even get uh, derivation and all of that. So they're saying, why can't we also say that? After all, it's our company of sorts, just as you see businesses, we see this as a state. So that's how much we're willing to pay. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, is people now saying, no, that doesn't make sense. Fine. If you're not able to pay, that means you're not viable. So let's have some sort of recapitalization exercise for states. We've talked about that on this show for quite some time now. The same way we do with banks, maybe we should recapitalize the state. So we draw the operating license of states that are not viable or downgrade them to a lesser tier. Maybe some states should be local governments, not states. Or merge them with another viable state that can better handle them. What, what is your take on this? I think this is a, a merely a theoretical argument. How do you capitalize a state? Do they issue shares and get people to buy into the state and become a stakeholders in that state? Or, you know, what do they do? Do they go to issue a state bond and raise more fund loan, loans that they cannot pay. They don't have resources and their activities to do to be able to raise money and pay those debts. And when you talk about that, what are the constitutional procedures you require to, to merge states or to defund the state and say you're no longer viable? So we've met with somebody. So that's going to, you know, going to be. A so very, the background, uh, pardon me, the background to this is the basic, and I know it is loose, but it's just a sense to make states know that if you're not performing, then something will be done. The basic role uh, of a government is to provide welfare and security. So if a state is failing in that simple and primary role of providing welfare. They call it minimum wage. It's not even a living wage yet. So that is a background to this. If a state is not able to provide welfare, does that state or does that government have any business in being a government or a state in this case? Of course, that calls to question the issue of whether our states are actually you know, uh, viable to stand on their own. That question has been there over the years. We are creating these states based on political considerations only. We have not looked at business or enterprise consideration of whether these states are viable or not. And that's a major concern in this country. And if you want to go into that, you have to go into major other major issues in fiscal restructuring, you know, in national uh, rejigging, whether we're going to run a regional government, or because, you know, this is only about minimum wage. You have to consider if the states have to pay for their policing, for their own security, you know, and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, services that are today handled by federal government. If we put them down to the state, even the issues around the infrastructure, road constructions, uh, electricity and so on, if we get all of that off federal government and put it to the state, can these states even survive? Clearly no, when they cannot pay minimum uh, wage. So in that sense, the argument is right that our states are not viable. What do we do about that? Do we need to sit governors down and teach them how to run businesses? And in all of these states, you see one result or the other that, that have been abandoned because we, we found oil. In some states, you see groundnuts and other grains. In some states, you see a lot of plantain and other vegetables and so on. In many states, you see solid minerals, gold, bauxite, tin, and so on. Nobody talks about these things. In many states, you see a lot of professors, academics, services that we can sell to other countries, we can export and make dollars. All Nigerian states are actually viable, if you ask me. In terms of uh, gift of nature, our lands are all arable. 
you know, we have all kinds of you know, you know, blessings of God in terms of oil, you know, even uh, gold, diamond, bauxite, you know, uh, grains, all kinds of vegetables. Why are we not focusing on non-oil uh, export? Why are these states not being taught entrepreneurship to harness what they find in their trade and make themselves viable? Their viability is only measured, you know, based on fact and location versus their humongous expenses, political things and so on today. And that's why that viability is upheld. But please, trust me, if you look at every state and what they can explore on their own and give account of their, those things, you know, with their corruption, every state in Nigeria, I believe, can be fired. That's the issue. All right. So this argument, you know, uh, you know, uh, keeps coming up. And if you look at 1981, when the law first came out, for example, minimum wage there was about uh, 125 naira, you know, uh, per month. And, and based on one naira to 61 uh, cent, in, you know, conversion rate from what I, I researched, you know, it was one naira to 0 0.61 dollar then. Nigeria workers were earning 204 dollars then. And that that progressively from they have become poorer and poorer and poorer, even with inflation getting higher and higher. All no right. Nigerian worker can uh, live, no individual in Nigeria can live under the minimum wage of today and not be time to be extremely poor or even multi-dimensionally poor. All right, let, you talk about, all right Mr. Okay. Hart, if I may butt in, uh, let's play with a bit of numbers uh, because some of the things about insolvency, recapitalization, possible merger, maybe in the long term, but we have a situation where there are there's a tripod situation here where everyone is grandstanding. Labor is grandstanding on the amount. The federal government has just proposed a little beyond what they promised, say we're going to add. It looks like a bit of grandstanding. The governors have always have come out to say we cannot pay. So let's look at data and see where we can begin to reconcile this situation because we're in a bit of a quagmire. If you look at budget state of state uh, data of 2022, you realize that uh, as we've always quoted, 70% of the states depend at least 50% of their resources come from the federal allocation, at least that level of okay. dependency. And if you look critically at the IGR, some states in 2022, their IGR was low as 6 billion naira. I'm talking about Zamfara State. In fact, there are three states that were less than 10 billion. Zamfara, I think Taraba, Yobe, and one other state less than 10 billion in IGR. So imagine if there was no fact, they will be insolvent. So looking at this reality and given the position of labor, how should labor now approach this state governor? Should we be talking of unique minimum wage or uniform minimum wage realistically? Uh, actually, if you have to be fair to these states, I believe that Nigerian states should be allowed to calculate and agree on the amount of wage they can pay to their staff. Just like they also have the right to decide the number of uh, uh, workers they can afford to carry. Nobody must force a state to employ 20 staff, for example, in their Ministry of Agriculture, if they can afford to only pay four or five people. You know, they can employ people they can pay and then find a way to uh, governance other services. If you are producing only six billion, why do you want to carry the number of staff, you know, uh, uh, that a, co a company or a state producing 100 billion carries? So you scale down your expenses in terms of your revenue. In every business, whether a national business or uh, agency, you must look at your revenue versus your expenses. And once they cannot add up, you either find a way to boost your revenue by producing more uh, goods and services, exploring what you have in your state, or you scale down your expenses. This is simple economics. So the governors must sit as the chief executive officer of their state and decide what they can afford. So to that extent, this should be a statewide issue. By the way, in economic uh, policy, income policy is no more popular anywhere in the world. It's only in Nigeria that we discuss this. You know, you can give a guide to say, why don't you pay this? But Income policy is not more popular. Everywhere in the world, governments apply basically fiscal policy and the monetary policy to drive the economy towards the, uh, the direction they want it to be. But here we are in Nigeria, still trying to, because if the market is vibrant and the economy creates jobs, we, this argument cannot happen. If I go to a state work and you're paying me 30,000 minimum wage, and I have a company or an entrepreneur who can pay me 60,000 or 50,000 and other allowances and make my life better, I will go there. 
It's simple economic. So in Nigeria, we have a major issue of efficient allocation of human and other resources. So that's why we talk about high unemployment. If we have a country like, you know, uh, uh, Luxembourg and so on, where unemployment is maybe around 1-2%, uh, uh, this agreement cannot occur. If I, go to, if I apply for a job in a state presenter or agency, and I find that they're paying me, let's say, 60000 a month, and somebody else is calling me into a computer business or a farm government and is offering me uh, 80000 why would I be making this argument? I quickly resign from government and go to where I may be rewarded mm -hmm. for my work and where I will also be vibrant to learn new skills and do things. So we are in this uh, web or crisis because of high level of mm -hmm. uh, unemployment in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uniqueness, you know, from what you're saying, suggests there could be some uh, migration from uh, states that are paying less to states that are paying more. I, I like to research, yeah, I like to take you up on your uh, earlier commentary about the viability of states and why uh, um, you know states should be more creative in internally generating uh, in in shoring up their IDR. Uh, speaking of which. There are companies in the country, you know, that are uh, uh, worth, that their net worth is in the realm of trillions. And these are managed also by individuals. So help us understand why it is that uh, states cannot be creative enough if, if the comparison can be applied to uh, a manager of men and resources in the, in the same capacity, maybe in... Um, dealing with more men and more uh, resources, but in the same capacity of a manager of resources, why they cannot, um, you know, increase the fortunes of their state? Is it because we're electing, uh, citizens are electing the wrong leaders, or what's, what exactly is the challenge? Every nation or every society gets the kind of leaders they deserve. All over Africa, and particularly in Nigeria in this case, the electoral process needs to be very mindful of what we promote. Are we promoting money back politics? You've got the money, you've got the position, you've got the votes. Or whether you get the vote or not, we make you a governor. What you can pay or bribe one person or the other. I'm, I'm being careful to do my words here. But the point in summary is that our electoral process does not produce the best we have in Nigeria. There are men and women, their names are all over the place, who have run. Uh, businesses successfully. Either they have run banks successfully, they have run oil and gas companies, they have run telecom businesses, they have run their own personal enterprise, they have run schools, they have run hospitals, they are all over the place. Nigeria is a country that is not lacking in terms of human capacity. Everywhere around the world, in America, Nigerians are medical directors of very sensitive uh, medical uh, systems. Everywhere in Europe, you find Nigeria doing great things in engineering, in, uh, in education, professors you know, everywhere. How come our electoral process is not bringing these guys up to run our states? Trust me, if our electoral dynamics change, whereby we bring up the right persons in this country and in this continent called Africa, there's no continent in the world that compares to Africa. Because Africa currently produces more than 30% of the world's natural resources, you know, uh, raw materials for productivity. But our problem remains our political system. You know, uh, uh, what you may call a tendency towards despotism and, uh, you know, high level uh, corruption in the electoral process. I can't say more than this. So, if you don't have a system that throws out your best, you have a system that throws out your worst, what do you expect? How can you expect a governor to give what he does not have? A governor that has, you know, barely done no business, right from when he became an undergraduate and so on, he was groomed and brought into the state. To talk about because his father was a, a, a former governor, a former yeah. governor secretary in the state, or in, in the political class. So it's an elitism problem that we have in this country. Because right. my father or my grandfather or great grandfather, you know, owned Nigeria, we, our family must continue to own Nigeria. Whether well. I'm, I'm competent or not, I will become your governor, whether you like it or not, in a state where you have better brains that can explore resources in that state quite, and make quite that deep state. issues and as you said sometimes people okay. just get the leaders they deserve but i don't i don't want to say we're staring down the barrel of a gun right now looking at what would happen this week uh, do you think it's justified for labor 
to still go on strike uh, with this proposal of 62,000 are from federal government and less than 60 as we hear from the state saying that um, I think it's far from what they envisage. They brought theirs to 250. So will this still be right for Labour to go ahead with a strike, seeing what happened last week when Labour literally shut down the nation? What would you be proposing? It's crunch time now, Mr. Demesway. We're winding down. Sometimes, without putting your foot down or your feet down, you may not achieve you know, uh, some purpose in life. There are, there are crises and conflicts you must avoid or accommodate or, you know, uh, compromise, and there are times you must have to fight. It looks like without a fight in Nigeria, labor never gets any increase in minimum wage. If you look at the history over the years, it was done in 1981, then 1991, 1999, or 2000, every 10 years. But inflation keeps going up every year. So labor looks like the only way they can get support for this government is to strike. So if they have to strike, so be it. That's my view. Because this government does not look at, does not listen to labor issues until they strike. But then when it comes to allowances, you know, uh, furniture allowance, dressing allowance and so on for politicians, we don't hear anything when these things are done. And trust me, they are done regularly enough to promote the kind of uh, thing that we deserve in this country, bad politics. We must thank you, uh, Mr. Audrey Demese, on this particular one, uh, because there's a lot of conversation. If you look at the numbers, which I like to look at, uh, there's also the narrative of the back-breaking debt burden on this state, and some will still want to borrow. And so it's, 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 the numbers don't really pan out well, but we hope that both Labour and the federal government will find a place uh, to just reconcile these numbers so that we don't experience what we experienced last week, Monday, and the economy grounded at the end of the day. Audio Dumeze is an economist and the CEO of Flame Academy and Consulting Limited. Thank you so much for weighing in on this particular issue of uh, the dispute between organized labor and government. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. God bless you all. As we say, it's an uneasy calm. Uh, Everybody is watching what will happen from today to the rest of the week whether Labour will again go on strike. We hope it doesn't happen, uh, but let's hope for the very best. But when we come back after this break, we'll switch gears. We're going to talk football. If you love football, it's a good time to be on the show. Join us again.